I'd like to go to Lisa Johnson. Now, Lisa, tell us from your perspective what you make of the medical grounds of this appeal. Bill's absolutely right that it's a desperate attempt to discredit Kopelman. And I feel like, you know, yet again, we're at a juncture where the US is really scraping the bottom of the barrel to try and prop up their non-existent case, prop up their groundless appeal. As Bill said, they're attacking Kopelman on the grounds that he sought to protect Stella and Julian's children from harm. And at the most recent hearing where the grounds for appeal were broadened, that was characterised as being a lapse, as being biased. There are things called criminal procedure rules that, you know, again, not a lawyer, but I understand that was what was said to be violated. And under those rules, expert witnesses need to be impartial and objective. So there's an argument that protecting Stella showed that he was partial and not objective, should be thrown out. And they said that Judge Baretza downplayed that too much. She said it was an understandable human response. So they're saying, well, you know, that's not good enough. But all of that is really a mischaracterization of what went on. So, you know, it wasn't a lapse. It wasn't biased. And even to call it an understandable human response, is it was more than that. So in terms of being biased, um, you know, Kopelman submitted two reports. One was... At the end of 2019, that was where he protected the identity of Stella and the children. Then another one, uh, the following year, just before the September hearings, then their identities were already known. During his first report, you know, to conceal the identities of Stella and the children worked against Julian's interests. It worked against the defence case and it even worked against Copeland's own arguments because he was arguing extradition to the US poses a very high risk of suicide and he said to the extent that he, I'm as certain as any psychiatrist can be that Julian is under suicide, that's a very strong statement. You don't often hear psychiatrists and psychologists say something with that much certainty around suicide and Kopelman has decades of experience. He's very senior. He's former chair of about five psychological bodies on the editorial boards of a bunch of peer-reviewed journals. He's right up there. So why would he, you know, and the fact that Julian has young children and he's in an ongoing relationship with their partner and he speaks to them as often as he can in Belmarsh and that's one of the things. It's a protective factor and that later came out as a key protective factor and one of the reasons that extradition would be such a risk is that Julian would be separated from his children and his family. So why would Kopelman suppress that when it was in Julian's interest? And the fact that he did really is the opposite of bias. It's the height of objectivity. And, you know, that was more than a human response. He was required to do that by his codes of ethics and professional practice. Psychologists and psychiatrists have a code of ethics that they need to abide by. So he was both an expert witness and he's also a psychologist and a psychiatrist. So he had codes of ethics that he's bound by in each of those areas. And as a psychologist and psychiatrist, we're all required to prevent harm and avoid acting in a way that can cause harm. And being an expert witness doesn't change that. And where children are at risk, psychologists and psychiatrists are required to. The child welfare is paramount always. So I'll just read the relevant sections of the ethical codes that Copeland was bound by. So the Royal College of Psychiatrists, with respect to responsibilities of psychiatrists who provide expert opinion to courts, says there's a duty, obviously, to form an opinion fairly and honestly about matters relevant to the court. However, psychiatrists must still pay attention to their medical ethical duties. They need to have regard to the person's welfare and to the prevention of harm albeit they are seeing the individual in a legal context. So those ethical duties that that refers to, so that's for expert witnesses, the ethical duties of a psychologist and a psychiatrist under the codes of ethics, that they're required to prevent serious harm occurring to another person. They need to ensure the avoidance of harm in which, quote, the child's needs are paramount. Psychologists and psychiatrists should contribute to whatever actions are needed to safeguard children. The needs or interests of adults should not be allowed to take precedence ahead of the needs of the child. So that's what Copeman was bound by. That's what he abided by. And, yes, no doubt there was an understandable human response, but he was also upholding his ethical responsibilities, you know, both as an expert witness and as a psychologist and a psychiatrist. And as Bill talked about, you know, he knew at the time what the world knows now, that Julian and his family were under threat. 
threats of kidnapping and poisoning and any psychologist or psychiatrist worth their salt knows that an entity, and that's essentially the prosecution, and the prosecution is the US national security state. That's the same entity that was talking about kidnapping and poisoning this Jordan's father. Um, and Stella said after the uh, the most recent hearing on the appeal that they've been enduring unpublicised threats and intimidation for years. So these are things the public doesn't know about. But now, thanks to Yahoo, a lot of even CNN reported on the kidnapping threats and so on. Copeland knew that. So any psychiatrist knows that any entity that's plotting to murder and kidnap a defendant is capable of anything. So he had to protect those children. He had no choice. It wasn't biased. It was ethical conduct. So, you know, I feel that at this point the British judiciary is at a really critical juncture in terms of the credibility and integrity of the British legal system, you know, because on the one hand... They can stand with the prosecution that's been plotting to kidnap and poison the defendant who's the key witness, is a convicted fraudster with a history of child sex abuse. They can stand there and seek to discredit a psychiatrist who is upholding his code of ethics and his responsibilities to protect child welfare. Or they can uphold an expert witness's right and obligation to act ethically. Uh, And I guess at this juncture it's it's no surprise that prosecution would be hostile to ethical conduct, but, you know, hopefully that's not the case for the British judiciary. So, you know, that's an important thing, I think, to be aware of in terms of Copeland's testimony. And it's a bit rich also that the prosecution is seeking to discredit Copeland when Copeland was the only expert witness to assess Julian during the time when he was suffering from severe mental health difficulties when he was in the healthcare wing. The others saw him after he'd been moved into the general population and, you know, he was feeling better as a result. Copeland saw him 17 times. Prosecution witnesses saw him a couple of times for a handful of hours. But was very sort of glowing in her description of Copeland's testimony because it was exemplary. It was over around a year He reviewed the prison records extremely thoroughly, which the prosecution witness, Blackwood, didn't. Got a lot of that wrong. Copeland took great pains to research background material, history, previous visits with psychologists and so on. Blackwood got into court and just like the first judge at the bail hearing called Julian a narcissist. So the prosecution calling Copeland biased is really the pot calling the kettle black, which has been something that the prosecution's done all the way through this. Um, I mean, one more thing to be said about the most recent hearing, the psychological evidence was also mischaracterised by the prosecution. The prosecution said that the prosecution expert witnesses disagreed that Julian showed traits of being on the autism spectrum, and that's not true. They both said that he showed autism traits There was only one witness who had the expertise to diagnose autism spectrum disorder. That was Dealey, and he performed a structured interview, as you should. He has a long, long background working with autism. He heads up the National Autism Unit. He's published papers on diagnosing autism, including in high-functioning people, which is a very specialised, very difficult area. You you require a lot of experience and expertise to be able to do that. Dealey was the only one with that expertise. So he's the one that made the diagnosis. But the prosecution witnesses did say that Julian showed autism traits, which is the material issue as far as suicide risk is concerned, whether he shows those traits. So essentially elaborating on what Bill said, that this is really a desperate attempt, scraping the bottom of the barrel to to attack rock-solid medical evidence. 